Welcome to the PI World interview recorded on Tuesday, the 2nd of November, 2021. And I'm your host, Tamsin Freeman. And today I'm delighted to be joined by financial pundit, David Buick, who's also a consultant to the Aquas Exchange, who will give us a macro market commentary. David, many thanks for joining us. Huge pleasure, Tamsin. Lovely to see you again. So when we last spoke in April 2020, the market had just crashed and we were heading for the worst recession in history. And yet now the Office for Budget Responsibility has forecasted that the UK economy will grow by 6.5% in this year and 6% in 2022. And even though they're softer comparatives, it's still impressive. Do you think it's realistic? I think, Tanzan, the first thing to realise is it's from a very low base. And I think the United Kingdom was underperforming the United States and pretty much every major economy in Europe and in the Far East. I mean, we really were very much in the doldrums. So this figure of 6.5%, it does take your breath away a little bit because it's a massive bounce from 4%. I think the figure that slightly worries me a little bit more is 6% in 2023. Ugh. I mean, that is a big, big ask when you consider most other countries... I was seeing a fair dip from twenty three to tw- from twenty two to twenty three, but I think you know um, there are such a huge number of imponderables um, which worry me a little bit. Um, it's not. I think the innovation is there. I think people want to really get back to work. I think um, that the idea that some of the companies that are being uh, built up around all over, whether it's fintech or anything, hugely exciting. I think uh, particularly in the United Kingdom, we are grossly undervalued. And that is basically as a result of the poor reception of Brexit. So it's got an awful lot going for it. I think the one thing that does worry me really is the supply chain. And I think the supply chain is a global one. Uh, Tamsin, you'll remember about three weeks ago, there were 71 ships docked outside San Diego and 42 docked outside Los Angeles. So everybody likes to think, oh, this is UK being idle and stupid and haven't planned properly. No, it's not. And the, break, and the sort of remain troop, get back in your box, because this is a global problem. I'm not saying that Brexit hasn't caused certain issues, because it has. But I think this supply chain is a major problem. And when you have people like Tim Cook saying, look, we've got to evaporate, that we've got to galvanise ourselves and do our own ships now, because to rely on the rest of the world, when you see the manufacturing of motor cars brought uh, well back from what its capacity is, I mean, you saw last week that Stellantis was 14% down on the previous quarter and Volkswagen was down 12%. So that gives you an idea of the problem. And if stuff gets stuck in, in the ports, the fact that we've had a pretty good recovery from retail is worrying. I mean, the only point I would make to you about retail um, is that everybody, I think, has got it slightly wrong and blaming the government for massive um, corporate taxes on, on properties and the rest of it. You know what? Retail's changed. And I think an awful lot to do with it is to do with COVID-19 and perhaps beforehand is that people now want to have a good time. And if they don't care that they look like nothing on earth. So if they're in sneakers, bobby socks and sneakers and got designer shovels, uh, stubble shaving, brilliant. Because if I can go to the pub three times a week and have a, a curry afterwards and go on two holidays instead of one, that's where I'm spending my money. And it's not the end of the world. What is the end of the world is those poor 180,000 people who've lost their jobs in retail, of which a high percentage are unlikely to find them again. And what are your views on inflation? Because we've got um, not only the freight issues, but we've got wage inflation and we've got resources inflation with the oil price going up and up. How do you see inflation? Do you see it secular? Do you see it hyperinflation? Do you see stagflation? What are your views? Well, I think probably if Jay Powell uh, and Andrew Bailey and uh, Christine Lagarde and Corroda Sand haven't got a clue, I don't know why I should. Um, but to answer your, try and answer your question relatively intelligently, um, I think that the central banks are of the opinion that any interest rate increases they have have got to be qualified. And if we got a yield on 10-year bonds of more than 2%, I think we'd have a serious problem because I think servicing the debt on a global basis, on that basis, would be breathtaking, would be mind-blowing. When you consider that the UK gilt market um, at a half percent hike in interest rates is 23 billion cost 
in the increase in borrowing costs. So, you know, it's a sizable amount. And I think all three of them, for choice, would prefer to leave uh, any rate increases until the new year. But I don't think they're going to be allowed to because uh, there are too many people out there saying that this, you know, yes, it is a supply problem and not a demand problem, but the supply is very limited and it's just stuff is not coming through. And, you know, when you get a situation like that, you are going to get up hikes in gas, oil, which we've seen dramatically, and we're going to see it over uh, in the shops over Christmas. And I think, to be honest with you, uh, 4% suggested by Andrew Bailey and 5.4% suggested by Jay Powell are unrealistic levels. I think most commercial economists are saying 5.5%. D. Buick is saying 6%, because I really believe, you know, that is going to be the problem. I don't myself actually think it's going to last much more than March. But I think I'm in a quiet minority um, because I think people realise the damage that a supply chain is doing and they've got to do something about it. Now, lorry drivers is one thing, but the use of trains instead of ships and all kinds of other things, you may get the prices going up quite dramatically over a short period of time. But I think people would rather get the supply chain sorted out by using relatively expensive forms of transport. I mean, shipping now is ridiculous. I mean, I think it's eight months ago, a container was 2,000 pounds. It's 16 grand now. And that is got to be passed on to everyone. And also, as we know, uh, Tamsin, ships take a long time, very, very slow. And so if we can quicken things up to a certain part of it by using trains, and short hauls on aircraft as well, because that is obviously, we you know, hugely expensive. And I know we're going to talk about climate change later. And I know that that is a problem with people, you know, blasting around the skies at the moment. But I do think it is going to be very sharp, very painful. Um, I'm very interested to see what Andrew Bailey does uh, on Thursday. I think, to be honest with you, I know him a little bit and I like him and he's a very good listener, but I think he's a bit timid. And he needs to stamp his authority. And what worries me is I would hate it on Thursday for him to come out on the other side of what the majority thinks. Because I think he needs to be seen as a strong governor who leads the charge and gets people behind him. I mean, we know for a fact that Michael Saunders and Dave Ramsden are going to vote for a hike. Um, we think some of the other um, internal people are not certain. I mean, Hugh uh, Pill is new as the chief economist. I don't think he's an Andy Haldane. Um, but I could see this thing being a 4-3. And if it is a 4-3, uh, I seriously hope that Andrew Bailey has led the charge. Because I think it's, authority at this time is unbelievably important. I think that uh, any kind of indecision was not a good thing, particularly since we've got quite a brittle economy over here. Uh, the one thing I do think we do have going for us, I mean, everybody is stacking the Brexit cards up against us, but would I rather be in the United Kingdom for recovery than Germany? You betcha, because how many people are going to buy thousands and thousands of motor cars in the course of the next six months when getting rid of your secondhand car is quite difficult and the requirements you've got to, and the fact that, you know, Elon Musk may be just adding another trillion to his total value or there it is a billion to his total value and a trillion for the company. But they're only producing 240,000 cars in a quarter. Um, and that isn't good enough, you know, when you consider that everybody else is behind the curve. I'm sure VW will pick up very quickly. But if you're not getting the chips and you're not getting the uh, equipment, uh, excuse me, I think I'll deal with uh, fintech and all the other technology and the other things financial services that this country is very decent at. And that, that, that's my worry. I think, to answer your question bluntly, what's going to happen? Right. It's going to 0.25% on Thursday. I think uh, there is a school of thought that says it should be 0.4%. I think that's too much of a statement. And I think you'll get three quarter percent rises in 2022, taking it up to a maximum of 1%. It's a long way from the guidelines of 2%, which is what the Bank of England wants, and reality, which says at the end of the year that it'll somewhere be between 5 and 6%.
And what do you think beyond there in terms of inflation? Do, do you think that, you know, we'll have this spike which you thought would be 6% and then we'll go back to 2% or do you think that it's going to run hotter than that? I think it's going to run probably, you know, as I say, <clears throat> six months from now. But I don't think it's going to be at the 5 or 6%. I'm hoping that if they can get the supply chain sorted out, and it isn't all down to drivers. Drivers would help enormously. But if, the, you know, the fact remains is that if we got the supply chain sorted out, I think inflation would come away. My one <clears throat> concern, which I know you're probably going to touch on on the climate change, is, is oil. Because everybody who thinks, you know, that the accord in Glasgow is going to be 100 people agreeing to one sort of thing and 180 people agreeing to another sort of thing, and we're going to do ring a ring of roses and it's all going to live happily ever after in your dreams, because the transfer from uh, oil and gas to green takes time. And it will take at least five to 10 years to actually achieve that goal. And so any kind of realistic. So if that is the case, is the oil price at $84 now sustainable? And I put it to you, maybe not because the transfer from oil to green is going to take longer. Um, there were lots of very distinguished people uh, in the course of the last six months, and not particularly a guy called Philip Lambert, who runs a company called Lambert Energy, who, incidentally, if you get him to speak, is brilliant on energy. He's very reluctant to talk. He's been bleating and screaming about gas for five years now, and nobody listened. Because it's clean, I'll rephrase that, it was clean, it was cheap, of course it's not cheap anymore, and it would have done a fantastic uh, fill gap without damaging the economy or the, the climate situation too badly. But my worry is that, you know, we're talking about the supply chain, but the other is the cost of energy. And do you think the environmental drive is driving up the cost of energy? Do you think there's a lack of investment in fossil fuels and therefore the price is spiking and we haven't we're not quite ready with environmentally friendly energy? I don't think we're anything like ready. And I think it is spiking it to a certain degree. Um and I don't think that um, you know, I was listening to George Eustace, the uh, environment secretary, talking about how we've improved things in the last 10 years by 40%, but it's 40% from a very, very low level. And I think, to be honest with you, the UK is pretty good. And I think they've done jolly well. Um, you know, whereas other countries, you know, we're, we're going to have huge problems with, um, you know, China, you know, you know, Russia, the United States to a certain degree. I mean, Biden is having an enormous problem getting his, um, whether it's three or $5 trillion budget through, you know, basically to deal somewhat with climate energy, Congress is not having it. And that when you hear a real player that is responsible for somewhere between 10 and 12 percent of emissions and they can't get their act together, you realize that you've got a, a real problem on your hands. I mean, I don't believe we should be negative. I actually feel the fact that they've got um, nearly 190 countries together even if, uh, you know, a percentage of them are saying rhubarb, 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 you know, the fact that they are talking and that we have we are getting some sort of agreement, we need to be positive because if we're negative about everything, it has this dreadful habit of rubbing off on any kind of optimism and any kind of positive outlook for the future. And therefore, I'm, I'm really keen... Uh, Forget party political um, support or nuance or anything else like that. We as a country need to be really positive about what we're going to do in this area. No, I don't hug trees. It's not my scene. But on the other side of the coin, I do see a real problem for my children, their children and their children beyond them. And we have to deal with this issue. And even if it takes longer than we think, if we really put our shoulders to the wheel and give it our best shot, and, you know, when you consider that, I mean, really innovative people like um, Jim Ratcliffe of Ineos. Now, he's opening a hydrogen plant in Germany and in Norway. And then he's going to follow it up with uh, plants, I uh, understand it, in France and uh, UK. I'm rather dispirited that he hasn't chosen us, but he says we're not ready. Hydrogen is clean and cheap. And you other people, there's an announcement today that Harlan and Wolf is considering doing some stuff, making some 
um, you know, um, plant and machinery for other companies and so they can't build any ships because nobody wants to do that anymore. And also over here, we're too expensive. That there's some serious innovation going on. And I, and I think that's hugely encouraging. And we have to be, for want of a better expression, gung-ho, fixed bayonet and over the top. And we've really got to go for it. But what time frame do you think is realistic? Do you think the government's time frame is realistic? If you don't go for an unrealistic time frame, people will just postpone it. Is it realistic? No. It has to be unrealistic in order to get people off their oversized backsides and into gear. And I think if you suddenly say, oh, well, you know what, 2030 is a bit unrealistic, we'll leave it till 2050. Really? Well, then everybody will go to the 2070 because that's the way it is. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, going back to inflation, I've got your um, views on the short term, but say three years out, do you think that we're heading for um, hyperinflation or do you think it's just going to be secular inflation? How do you see it playing out over the next five years? I think really um, inflation to me is really geared around profitability, innovation and debt. And everybody likes to sweep debt under the carpet. And all I would say is, please don't do so. But the one reason why I don't believe um, that we can afford um, Tamsin to have a really massive hike in interest rates is the world's economy would fall over. Um, because if the margins are very thin and they just couldn't take it, and if you have that sort of margins that everybody contracts, then what you get, you get massive unemployment. So, as I said to you, I think if the bond market up to 10 years, doesn't matter where you are, whether it's the UK, United States of America, the euro, the rest of it, um, is basically cannot see yields for 10 years of much more than 2%. Because I think we then, we then we have a serious problem because taxation goes up. And if taxation goes up as a result of which in order to meet that demand, then people have got less disposable income and then they spend less at their shops. I mean, sorry, I'm talking to you like you're like a child. Please forgive me. I don't mean it like that at all. I'm just saying, you know, that's what happens. Then you get unemployment. So I think it's a very, very fine line. And when I look at some of the borrowing requirements, I mean, we, we, we go through our teeth when our 2.2 trillion, we go, yeah, well, go and look at the United States. Go and look at Japan. That's eye-watering stuff. And whilst you can say that the um, dollar and, to a lesser degree, the yen are reserve currencies and everybody will buy each other's debt, it's not quite the same with the United Kingdom, but we do have the best debt office in the world, uh, which enables us, I think, to keep our rates at a level that perhaps, you know, in terms of our importance in the world, probably should be a little bit higher. And I think, it's, you know, huge credit goes to them for that. But because I think... The constraints on interest rates are limited. Um, the outlook for inflation, uh, and I'm not an economist, I need to make that very clear, um, is nothing like, or I'll rephrase it, can't afford to be as negative as perhaps many people would like to think, because I think the situation would be hopeless. The one thing I would do, and I think your listeners and you should be very grateful that I'm not a chancellor and I'm not a central banker, is... I would be paying far, far more attention to tapering quantitative easing than I would be doing putting interest rates up. I would much rather see Jay Powell tomorrow saying, and we know he's going to taper it a bit, but him tell the market, you know, you know what, guys, I'm going to do a lot more and it's going to start happening pretty soon. And then you'll see the unnecessary belt tightening or the, the necessary belt tightening going on. And I hope Andrew Bailey, in a way, follows suit. I, I find I've been listening to Christine Lagarde for 20 years. I still haven't got a clue what she's saying. I haven't got a clue. No idea. I'm sure she's very competent. I'm sure she um, does a very good job. But for me, she talks in riddles. So, I mean, I just can't go with it. So if they are to taper or if they chose to taper, what effect do you think that would have mm. on the economy and, of course, on the stock exchange? Well, the stock exchange is, <clears throat> to a certain degree, tapering. If it's done over a long period of time, we'll learn to wear with it. <clears throat> we'll learn to wear it. Um, but what it will mean, of course, is with this, is that there's going to be probably less, um, you know, banking money around for loans. Um, so people will have to run much tighter ships. Um, if you were to see a combination of um, uh, tapering, uh, aggressive tapering, 
and a dramatic hike in, rate, hike in rates. Now, what do I mean by dramatic hike in rates? Two to three percent by the end of 2023. Then make sure your tin hat's not too far away because you're getting a very bad message. Yeah. And do you look at the um, bond yield curve very much to get an indication as to where you think we're headed? Yeah, and I nearly always get it wrong um, because I think, um, to be honest with you, um, the short end of the market is, I still think there's plenty of scope for it to go up, but it just never does particularly. Um, as I say, I, I really genuinely concentrate on the 10-year because that is the average cost of most countries' debt. And um, I tend to, you know, try and keep things for myself as simple as I possibly can. And, you know, it's just that if you look at what's happened in the UK, in the middle of August, I mean, the yield on 10-year guilt was 0.5%, and it's now 1.07%. Now, that you might say, well, that's peanuts. But as a percentage increase, it's dramatic. And it does make a difference. So coming back to the debt and the inflation, or if you let inflation run hot ahead of interest rate rises, then surely you inflate away some of your debt, which would serve the government. I think that is, um, if I may say so, uh, a measured bet that I think the central banks are taking on. And to be honest with you, I respect them for it because I would do the same myself. I think it, I think you're right. And I think that's what they're counting on. And, um, and I'm very hopeful that that will be the case. But you need to have a plan. Uh, and I think one of the things that if I... I was talking to a very distinguished economist yesterday, and he, what he was saying, and I, I rather agree with him, is that, OK, we're out. It doesn't matter if you're a Remainer or a Brexiteer. We're out, period. That's it. And what hasn't happened from this government is a cogent clear plan of how this country is going to be taken forward economically for the next five years. And to me, it's jolly hard for a professional economist to be asked what his opinion is on the UK economy in terms of interest rates, output, growth, all that sort of thing, unless you've got a plan. And I was quite surprised. I mean, I think Rishi Sunak is um, breathtakingly intelligent. I think he's very approachable. I think he's delightful. Um, I think he probably struggles a bit more with uh, his neighbour than we perhaps think about. Um, and I think he's finding it quite hard to get his way. And I think the uh, Bank of England and the Treasury are uh, not easy bedfellows, I think is the best way I'd put it to. I think, from what I gather, that um, um, the relationship between the Treasury and Sunak is extremely good. But I don't know about the Bank of England. I really don't. And I think for a successful team, I think you've got to try and sing from the same hymn sheet. I know the Bank of England has its independence, and whether one likes it or not, the idea of it, I think basically it, work, it does work. So um, I think the next two months is going to tell us a lot of where we are on the interest rate front. And I really hope that uh, Rishi Sunak comes out with a five-year plan that we can all find, you know, a hat stand or a peg to put our chapeau on so that we can actually hove to and actually give ourselves a great chance of making, you know, a success of Brexit, which at the moment looks horrific and very disappointing for those who voted for it. Um, but nobody, uh, you know, nobody counted on Brexit, on covid and I think that was a serious setback. But it's easy for people, in my opinion, to uh, accept even what they don't, didn't like if we had a plan. And I don't think we've got one. And what sort of things would you like as part of that plan? I would like to know exactly what he's going to do as regards what he'll be allowed to do <laughs> as regards the green economy. I would like to know the terms of the investment that we're going to have for uh, fintech. Um, I would like to know what um, areas of, um, of uh, development we're going to see on our export front. I mean, we hear that uh, Liz Trust did a good job, but all the contracts that have been agreed subsequently um, have been pretty small. 
and, you know, just how he is going to stimulate the economy. It's all very well turning around, Thames, and saying, you know, we've got massive debt. We need education, fiscal education. We need um, disciplines. I, I get all that, but you've got to get, you have to have a plan. And I'd like to know exactly what he's got going for us in all those areas, exports, uh, energy, um, development of uh, technology, um, all these sort of things. And I think they're fundamentally important. And the way, of course, the private sector, the public sector is going to play a role because unless you have a really buoyant private sector, frankly, the public sector can whistle because it's not going to get any increased funds. And were you surprised there weren't more tax increases in the latest budget? I thought we've had enough anyway, to be honest with you. I mean, if you think about it, um, we had the one and a quarter percent national insurance contribution and the dividend increase and the jump in corporation tax, um, which was relatively substantial. And when you consider that yours and my gas price how we're going to run our car, how we're paying for stuff in the shop. Most young people like you have got their mortgages going up. They've had a double whammy. And people, you know, it's disposable income has taken a hammering. And I would have been utterly amazed um, had he uh, put any more into taxation. I mean, we're going to need it, but not at the moment. You see, I wouldn't have done anything until after 2022. Why? Because if you're telling us all that the growth is going up from 4 to 6.5% or 6%, <clears throat> that means that the Treasury is going to get an awful lot more money. And then you won't, <clears throat> excuse me, and then you won't stop the impetus. And I think momentum, impetus, and confidence are three fundamental ingredients. And if you don't have them, you're in trouble. So if you, if you, you know, hammer people away with taxation, incentives very important. And, you know, there's no question that we uh, have still got, which I find completely unacceptable, regardless of political persuasion, the gap between those that have and those that have not have widened at a level that is completely, by any social standards, totally unacceptable. I don't care if you're a right-wing Tory or if you're a communist, it's wrong. And we have to do something about it. And one of the things uh, Boris has tried to do, but there again, it's a glib comment, increase the wages. Yeah, OK, Boris, fine. Thanks for that. But we have to have a little bit more of a plan for doing that and how you actually get around it. And, and you know, I don't have all the answers, but there are enough, how can I put it, geeks in the civil service and in think tanks to come up with some ideas that can be bounced around, talked about, uh, diluted, added to the rest of it. But it, it is a, a very fundamentally important thing. And I think the next um, um, 18 months is going to be absolutely crucial. I mean, I'm not, I'm getting rather tired of the party political bit. You know, Boris has got an 80 overall majority, decent worry. But he could lose a lot of that the next election if all the red wall falls down. I want to see what he's going to do for the country so that people feel that they're getting a fair rub of the green. And therefore, I wouldn't have put any taxation up apart from the corporation tax. And the other thing that didn't get much um, comment in the press was that any kind of, oh, we're going to do this for education, we're going to do that for the national service, we're going to do this for pensioners, and oh, your booze is coming down, and all this stuff. 2023, that's history. I want it now. And that's where... <clears throat> I'm slightly critical. I think he had an absolutely horrific hospital pass as a as a chancellor for doing a budget at this time. But I think it it recalled for some seriously bold thinking. Um, I think Boris is too bold. Live now, pay later, and I'm not sure that's quite the right attitude. But I would have I would have taken the gamble and allowed the economy to really push on for people to get jobs, to get better, you know, to get better pay, uh, to create more uh, income for the, for the Treasury. And I think that's the way I would have done it anyway. 
And what do you think the increase in corporation tax, what will the effect of that be? Because it's massive. It's gone from 19% and going up to 25% from April 23. How will that play out? I think, it'd be, I think it's probably OK. Um, I think what worries me, of course, is um, the bottom line, the level of dividends, um, pensions, all that kind of thing is quite important. But if the other incentives are there, you should be able to get away with that. Um, you know, if we're doing really well as a country and if we're really making, you know, really good profits, uh, I don't think, you know, that we should be too worried about that. The other thing is, is that I'm, how can I put it, if I was the, uh, the, the prime minister and people must be deeply grateful that I'm not, I'm much more of a maverick because if I was struggling and I needed to get uh, Hujma Flip, PLC technological company to come to London, I wouldn't think twice about cutting the corporation tax to make it like the Irish did, like many other countries like Greece did, like loads of other countries is in order to give us a really big thing. In the European Union, you can't do that. And I know um, we've agreed this 15% deal with, with, with Biden, 15%, yes, please, I'll have all of that. But um, I don't think it's particularly meaningful. Um, but what I do want is I want the flexibility to be able to say, you know, we run our own affairs. And if we need to adjust something like corporation tax, because it's not working and we're losing business to other parts of the world, then we just do something about it. And um, for investors, there's loads and loads of moving parts at the moment. Where do you think that investors are good to invest their money for their future security, whether in different asset classes and in particular sectors? I think that's a very difficult one. Um, asset classes, I mean, for instance, um, I think when people get involved in things like Ethereum and Bitcoin and that sort of thing, they need to learn an awful lot more about them than they do. I mean, I know, particularly speaking for myself, I've missed out horribly, but I'm sleeping quite well. And, you know, I don't, don't think I could take that big crash that comes with volatility. So in those things, I think other things that rich people get involved in, like wine and paintings and stuff like that, there will always be a market in those sort of things. Equities, I think, and property are really the two asset classes that we, we have to look at. Um, my home is my castle, of course, is the big one um, for most individuals. Um, we've seen quite a bounce um, in uh, domestic um, property prices. Interesting to note that people feel now that with after the budget, that, you know, and with inflation about and the possibility of higher interest rates, that the prices of property will come off. I think these things are, tend to be secular. And I think they'll, they'll, they'll come back again in the fullness of time. Equities, I think you just have to be extremely selective. We've seen such a breathtaking rally. I mean, the s and up, what, nearly 23% this year after a massive rise in 2019-20. The NASDAQ, of course, we know, with all those great apples and alphabets and, uh, and Amazons and Zooms and all these other people that land and research and all these other companies that posted breathtaking um, Microsoft um, profits. They're going to be there at the, at the end of the day because the innovation um, of um, technology is what's going to take all these companies forward. And they're going to buy little companies that are probably four blokes, you know, sitting in Loughborough, come up with an amazing idea that you and I haven't thought about. And somebody's going to buy it. And I think technology is, is, is the way forward. And, um, you know, I, I would always uh, want to have some involvement in that. Also, I'm a, a, a big believer, and it's, it is slightly spivvy at the moment, but... Healthcare, I think, is incredibly important. I think some of the big companies like the AstraZeneca's, the Novartis's, the Pfizer, or Pfizer due to post stellar numbers today, but they've actually underperformed what they've achieved. And I'm very much into the small, you know, uh, biotech that's got a new drug that's going to go into the pipeline of one of these big things. So I think that's an incredibly exciting thing. I think it becomes more important um, as the developed world joins us, or underdeveloped world joins up. And I like that very much indeed. I mean, 
energy companies, banks. Well, banks have had a fabulous rally. I mean, apart from Standard Chartered Bank, um, the UK banks have rallied between 30 and 45 percent since the beginning of the year. My God, they needed to because their performance in the last 12 years since the banking crisis has been pitiful. Um, whereas the New York banks haven't because um, they took hold of this thing called TARP. And even if they didn't need it, even people like Goldman Sachs were told by, you know, uh, Hank Paulson and others of the day, you will have TARP, period. And it got them out of a jail very quickly and made them perform very quickly. I think the capital requirements required now by a bank that if we see another hike in interest rates, providing it's not too much, because if it is too much, then you're going to have, you know, uh, contingency plans for bad debts going up again, and you're going to have people foreclosing on their homes and the rest of it. I think banks are interesting, but um, not brilliant for me. I missed a big one, uh, and I hope they do well. There are loads of wonderful recovery shares, of course, like Rolls-Royce. I mean, I'm, I'm excited by that. I'd be probably excited by by Boeing in a funny sort of way, because I think they've lagged horribly behind. Um, I think defence in the United States is not a sector that should be ignored. I think it's going to increase and plant, multiply and be very, very important. All these general dynamics and Lockheed's and, you know, United Technologies and various other companies that Raytheon, they're all going to be important. Japanese technology, I like Japan enormously. Japan had a terrible setback this year by losing the Olympic Games, which lost them so much momentum because they've sorted out their very sort of um, strange regulation. I mean, the investment in Japan five or ten years ago, I would only describe it as incestuous. Everybody invested in each other and it was awful. Well, regulations really sorted that out and I think Japan is a, it's a place that I would not be averse to having some money. I hope they get through what they missed out through the Olympic Games. I genuinely think they will. Um, there are there are opportunities out there, Tamsin. and I just think you need, need to be perhaps a little bit more careful than perhaps we all were before. And you have to be very selective on where you think you know the world is going. And what about gold and commodities, which are seen as a inflation hedge? Gold, I think, is it's a professional's market, um, and it's again one of these things. Is uh, David Buick? Do not go there unless you feel that the uh, equity market is going to fall out of bed and you're looking for a safe haven to park your Tuttons Haveny for five years or something, I don't know enough about it. And I, I salute those who do. People use it as, as a haven of rest and they use it very intelligently. And of course, it's a very professional market based not only but also on the, on the, on the value of the dollar. And um, I know it's very good at I, when you talk about um, uh, commodities um, in terms of, um, of attracting money as an alternative asset class and also for anti-inflation, a lot of people now turn to Bitcoin. It's interesting. I mean, Bitcoin is huge now. And when um, the central banks start taking a serious regulatory look at it, I don't think it's going to damage Bitcoin at all because I think it's going to be people are going to be far more educated. Interesting. David, many, many thanks indeed. Again, a, a wonderful overview of where we're at in the macro picture at the moment. Tell people where they can find you. Well, but basically they can find me, you know, on, on Twitter, at TrueMagic68. I work for Aquas Exchange at the moment until as long as he wants me, and I'm loving it. Brilliant. Thank you so very much indeed. Not at all. Lovely to talk to you, Tabby. And to our listeners, please comment on this interview and on the various media platforms. It helps to drive engagement, which enables us to get the very best speakers. And to get a notification of a new video as it's published with no spam, go to piworld.co.uk on the top right hand side where you can subscribe. Thanks for listening and stay well.